It came to pass the day after that he went to a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. When he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead set up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen among us, and that God had visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region around about. I want to talk to you this morning on life's five great powers. Life's five great powers. In the gospel according to Luke uh, chapter 7 verses 11 through 17 from which we are taking our text. We have the story of that of Jesus raising a widow's son. Outside of Jesus Christ's resurrection and outside the saint's resurrection that was connected with Jesus, you remember that? It's in Matthew 27, 52, and 53. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So when you take into account Jesus Christ's own resurrection, and you take into account of the resurrection that happened after Jesus' resurrection, there are three total people that Jesus Christ raised from the dead, as was recorded in the Bible. Each one was, uh, was in a different state of decay. There was Lazarus, John 11 and 39, probably perhaps maybe the longest. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he had been dead for four days. And then there was Jairus' daughter. She probably had maybe just died, maybe a few moments, a few minutes. Matthew 9 and 18. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain, a, a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And then now there's the widow of Nain, son. This is probably the first resurrection, the one that Jesus resurrected. This is probably the first one. Luke 7 and 12. Now when he came nigh to, this, to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out. He probably had been dead maybe a day. Life in the first century in the Middle East was very difficult. Men often died at a very young age. When a husband died, the wife would struggle with her children to do the work and to help farm, to plow in the spring and to plant, to harvest in the summer and gather the grain in at harvest time, as well as all the duties that a mother had besides that. She prepared the meals. She would grind the flour for the bread, and so on. But the widow had no children to raise to farming. She and her husband had but a single child, a son. He had cared for his mother in her widowhood. He had done the hard work of that of the farming, but now he was gone. Now they come into the gate of the city. She was headed to the place where her husband lay, 
But not only does she come along with the funeral procession to the gate of the city, but Jesus comes along with many of that of his disciples and much people as well, and they arrive. This was a very popular time in Jesus Christ's Galilean ministry. He was engaged in preaching and teaching, going from town to town throughout the whole region, declaring the good news of the kingdom of that of God. Originally, he was traveling alone, but the others began to come. And where he went, miracles took place. The sick, the mentally anguished, the demon-possessed, the lame, the blind, the lepers, all found hope because of his presence. Through his touch, life could be different for them. Look at the scene that we have before us just for a moment. And when you reduce this story down to its very essentials, it comes down to just two people. Jesus coming to town and a weeping, heartbroken widow leading the procession that bears her dead son to his final resting place. Just two People, when anyone suffered, Jesus suffered with them. He would not stand in the presence of that of sorrow without being touched. In verse 13, we are told this, And when the Lord saw her, He had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. When she heard these words, she probably was astonished. Why should I not weep? My son, my only son, is gone. But Jesus stopped the procession and said to the dead son, Young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. How happy the mother must have been. I'm sure she thanked Christ with all of her heart. In this story, there are five great powers of life. Life's five great powers. And I want to tell you about those this morning. First of all, this is part of life. There's the power of that of death. I have kind of been associated with death pretty much all my life. When I lived in Williamston in Martin County uh, on Doodle Hill, I lived on a street called Road Street. Road Street was a street that ran right beside Woodland Cemetery. Woodland Cemetery was a huge, huge cemetery. If you go down the road from my house a little bit on the left, that was the original. That was where it started. That's where they had the graves on top of the ground. I think going back to the 1700s. And then across the street was the newer part. That's where a kid was that I rode a bicycle. Anybody ever remember taking balloons and putting on your back tire and putting between your, your, your spokes on your, on your tire? And, and you, just for a brief time, you had the sound of thrush mufflers. But it wouldn't be long. Those spokes would wear a hole in that balloon and they would pop. Then when you didn't have any balloons, you would take some cardboard Close pins. Anybody remember that? Anybody got even close pins anymore? Amen. And we were right up and down the cemetery. And I remember when it would become real stormy. There wasn't a whole lot to do in the house, but stay in the house. 
we would look out the window, we would look out the door, and you could see when it got real dark, the lightning flash, and those tombstones, they would just light up. But little did I know, at a very young age, at the age of eight, brother 11, sister 6, that my mama would die with leukemia. I've been associated with death pretty much all my life. The power of death. Before Jesus Christ resurrected this young man, if you would touch his face, there would be new life there. There would be no warmth there. There would be nothing but, but dead of coldness. Death had exercised its power on him. The power of death is a universal power. First of all, physical. Through Adam's sin, sin brought sin and death. The first sin wrought the moral ruin of that of the human race. In Romans 5 and 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Verse 14, Nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Romans 5 and 19, for as by one man's disobedient, many were made sinners. Y'all, death is a universal thing. Sad to say, they're infants. They're infants that never make it out of their infancy. That for some reason or another, we have infants that die. And you know why even people, they even get older. And I'm talking about good more people. Still good more people. They still die. In other words, it doesn't make any difference if it's an infant. doesn't make any difference if it's a good moral person. doesn't make no difference in the situation. Death is a very universal thing. And it has no respect of that of persons. Amen? Come on, y'all hang with me this morning. Here's what Hebrews said in 9 and 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. In the doom of the unbelieving dead, in the last judgment, in Revelation 20 and 12, we read these words. Just a portion. Here's what John said. I saw the dead... Small and great stand before that of God. Not only is the, there the power of death, the power of death is a universal thing. The power of death is also an appointment in which we are helpless. This young man lived in a city, a town called Nain. Do you know what Nain means? It means green pastures. It means a place of beauty. If you were in Nain, you could look over and you could look down in the valley of Jezreel. A very beautiful place. Place sounds like where Deborah would like to live. On a hill, on a mountain, and look down in the valley. Green pastures. A beautiful place. But Nain, the green pastures, the beautiful place, could not hold back the ugliness of death of death. Boy, y'all quiet. Well, I guess this is not anything to shout over yet. The mother was a widow. Her husband had already died, had already passed away. 
You would think that maybe death would have some pity on her. She's already lost her husband to death. He's already been buried. But this widow woman, this mother, it did not matter. She was helpless. Luke 7 and 12, Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow. When you're a widow and you've lost your husband, then you what you probably try to do, you've got the support of your family, of maybe your son, or maybe your daughter and their family. They will rally to, you, to the cause, surround you, support you, be there. But Jean, the thing about it is, this widow woman, she's lost her husband, and now she's lost her son. There is no respect there. She's helpless. It doesn't make any difference. But then there's her son, her only son. He dies, and he dies young, the Bible said. He's not old, he's young, but it does not make any difference. He's helpless over that in the matter. But then there's the city of Nain itself, beautiful, green pastures. Even the city comes and supports her. I don't know who's there. I don't know if the mayor's there. Members of the board of the town are there. I don't know if the preacher's there altogether. I just know there's a whole lot of people that are supporting this widow woman for now. Billy, it doesn't matter. The widow woman, the mother, the young son, the city, they are all helpless. And it does not matter. You see, y'all, there's no respect of persons when it comes to death. It doesn't make any difference, your, your state, your condition. It doesn't matter. But up to now, I've been talking to you about the power of death from the perspective of physical death. But there's something that people rarely think about. Have you ever thought about not just physical death, but have you thought about spiritual death? Or the second death? Or eternal death? Have you ever thought about that? It's in Revelation 20 and 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Did you know the saying? You've heard it before. If you're born once, you die twice. But if you're born twice, you die once. In other words, if you've been born once, you've just been born of the physical, but you have not been born of that of the Spirit of God. Those that are going to stand before the great throne of God, the great white throne, uh, they are there because they have rejected Christ. They have not been born twice. They've been born one time, but they're going to die. And they're going to die a second time. A spiritual, eternal death. Do we ever think about that? That death and hell is going to be cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. Somebody did tell me one time at the hospital, I really probably would enjoy going to probably Ronnie's church and hear Ronnie preach. And somebody stood up and said, oh no you don't. He preaches a hellfire and brimstone. Billy, I just cannot phantom in my mind of going to a place that was prepared for the devil and the fallen angels. 
that left their first estate. My brother, that was never originally intended for man to go. But when people reject Jesus Christ and will not be born the second time, God has no other place to put you. To go to a place there like that among the devil and the fallen angels and even the Bible says it's a place of death of outer darkness. I was listening to one of our guys in the shop. I don't know. This topic came up. Death came up. Heaven and hell came up. And and he kind of was, I just sit back and let him talk, let him babble along. He says, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I don't know if I'm going to hell. But I do know where I'm going to have the most friends. And he says, basically, he's going to have the most friends in hell. I had rather go to heaven if I don't have but one or two friends. But can you think about this? I, I reckon we'll get finished sooner or later. I still have fond memories of my mom. I still have fond memories of my dad. I just have memories of my granddad, born in 1899, and my grandma, born in 1900. I still have fond memories of dead of Deborah's mom and dad, preachers of the gospel, Reverend R.T. Lawrence and Margaret Lawrence. I still have fond memories of that of Danny Fleming. Can I tell you something, just a little humor to break the ice a little bit? Danny was in a camp meeting, Mary, one year. Oh, he was not in the camp meeting. T. Long says this, and and I'm going to say it, and forgive me for saying it. He looks over here where Danny usually sits and says, Danny's not with us, and if you don't know who he is, he's the man that sits in the electric chair. And... And T. Long says, man, if he's in the electric chair, he really needs prayer. But I still got memories of Danny. And I, I still got memories of, of loved ones. And yo, I, I, Orman, I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine going to a place separated from them, but not only from them, but for the, from the presence of God forever and forever and forever. And all the good things and all the holy things and the light and be cast into a place called the lake of fire, which is the second death. You know what? We need to think about this. Come on. We need to think about this. I mean, I want to be with the Lord and be with him forever and ever and be with my loved ones. I need to move on. Not only is there the power of that of death, but there's the power of that of love. The widow weeps because she loves her son. Love is one of the greatest powers on earth. It was great enough to bring God's Son down to this earth. But listen to this. It was great enough not only to bring God's Son down to earth, but it was great enough to bring God's Son to a place called Nain. Nain was just really a little crossroads. Just a small village, just a small town. Yo, it was not a Jerusalem. It was... Not a Bethlehem. It was not a Nazareth. It was just a little place, a little town. But there was a love of death of God. God sent His Son. And His Son came. And not only did He come to Bethlehem, and not only did He go to Nazareth, and not only would He go to Jerusalem, but He would go to a place that seemed like there was no much significance for Him to be there, to a widow, though we don't even know her name. That's the power of that of love that God gave that of His Son. Love gives. 
For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Not only does love give, but love ministers. There was the desire of James and John. They wanted to be first in Mark 10 and 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. I like what Peter said in 1 Peter 4 and 8. It covers above all things have fervent charity among yourselves for charity which is love covers a multitude of sin Deborah's uh, Sunday school lesson this morning dealt dealt with the woman of Samaria that had been married five times And the man that she was with then was not her husband. Can I tell you this? God has not called us to sit back and judge people. But He's called us just to love people. And you know what? He will do the judging. And He's going to judge righteous and He's going to judge right. You know why? Because sometimes when you pass judgment, you don't know all the story. You may know part of the story, partial, but the Lord knows it all. But that's what love does. It will give, it will minister, and it will cover. And it will cover a multitude of sin. Joy McElroy made a good observation and a statement that she made. Sometimes about sin, we have a tendency with sin to category uh, sin, about good sins, about bad sins, great, small, and, and, and that is uh, small sins. And, and she made the good statement. She said, sometimes we look at sin like buildings, you know, big buildings, small buildings. But you know what, Billy, when God looks at sin, He don't look at sin as far as the shape of buildings. He looks down. He looks down. And they are the same. But love will give, amen, and love will minister, and love will cover, and cover a multitude of that of sin. It is the greatest. 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is that of charity, or that is love. Hey, you know what you need to do? You need to love God. But not only do you need to love God, but some of you need to even love yourselves. And you need to love your family. You need to love your friends. You need to love your neighbors. You love to love love your enemies. You even need to love the church. So there's the power of death. And there's the power of that of love. But here's the third thing. There's the power of that of tears. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. What exactly is a tear? If you ask a scientist what is a tear, he or she would tell you it's just purely A chemical thing. If you were to ask a surgeon what is a tear, he or she would tell you it's just a secretion of the duct in the eye whose function is to cleanse and to flush and to uh, the delicate surface of of the organ. But if you ask a mother who's getting ready to bury her only son, what is a tear? She probably would tell you, I just cannot explain it. I just cannot put it in words. But if you would ask Jesus, what is a tear? Jesus would pretty much tell you this. This is what moves me to compassion. He might even throw in this. Tears are a language that God understands. When is the last time some of you cried? Come on. When is the last time that some of you has just literally cried. And I'm talking about crying over the right things and not the wrong things. 
There's at least three places in the New Testament that we're told about Jesus, that Jesus cried, that Jesus wept. One of them was when he went to the cemetery where Lazarus was. You remember that? This is the shortest verse in the Bible. Billy, you can tell, you can tell Jim you learned something today. I learned what the shortest verse in the Bible is. She already knew that. She's, she's pleading her cause in case to me right now. Jesus wept. I read something behind somebody made a statement about that. Why did really, Albert, why did really Jesus weep? I, I think he was touched by that of Mary and that of Martha because they were weeping. I, I accept that. But somebody said also this. Here's the other part. Devere, maybe he was also weeping because he didn't really altogether want to call Lazarus back at that good place where he was. Jesus wept. He cried. How about, how about this? You remember that he looks at Jerusalem? Joy, you pulled that up as well. He comes to Jerusalem. Thou that killest the prophet, stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under the wings, and you would not. I, I just want to ask you some questions. How many times have recently have you looked upon your nation and you have wept and it has brought you to tears? How many times have you looked lately maybe over your county or over your city or over your community and and you have wept and you have shed some tears. I need to put this in. We would like to see people saved, would we or would we not? Would we or would we not? Well, I'm going to tell you this it's going to cost you some tears. And it's going to cost you some pain. You see, when Zion travails, sons and daughters are born into the kingdom of God. Oh, the third one is this. And it's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Though you will not altogether find that probably altogether that I can remember in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, but it's mentioned later. And Joy's going to pull up Hebrews 5 and 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication, was strung crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, was heard in that he feared. In other words, Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, he is crying and he's weeping over that of a whole, the whole world. In Acts 20 and 31, the Apostle Paul calls the Ephesian elders together. Therefore, watch, remember that by the space of three years, he says, I cease not to warn everyone of you night and day with tears. I like what the David said in the Psalms. Psalms 126 and 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So, there's the power of what? There's the power of death. But there's the power of that of love. But there's also the power of that of tears. But here's the fourth thing. There's the power of that of prayer. In our message last week, if you were not here, one of the points that I made mention to the congregation was the fact that there is a God who is in heaven that hears and answers the prayers of those who call upon him. I mentioned the prayer of James and Job and Jabez and Elijah. Surely the widow prayed for her son, but the answer was delayed. God answers her prayer in the best way. There's power in prayer. And prayer changes things. Chris, you remember when God speaks to Jacob and said, Jacob, you've been gone from home long enough. 
It's time for you to go back home. Jacob has got mixed feelings about this. He wants to go back, you know, because there's no place like home. But he's got mixed feelings in that he don't really want to go back because he knows that he has, he has wronged his brother. And you know what? On the way back, he separates himself from about everything and he gets alone with that of God. And you know what he does? He wrestles with the angel of the Lord to the break of day. Joy's going to pull up a verse of scripture. I think she is. The angel says unto him, what is thy name? And he said, my name is Jacob. Look at this. And the angel said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. You have prayed. And your prayer has changed some things. Billy, you know what it changed? He even got a new name. He goes from Jacob to Israel. He was a supplanter, but now he's a prince with that of God, Israel. Not only did it change his name, but it changed the way that he walked. Did you know that after he wrestles with the angel, Albert, he has a little bit of problem. He's got a little a little little bump in his giddy up. He does not walk like he was walking at one time. Did you know that when you pray and God gets a hold of you and you get a hold of God, did you know you don't walk the same way that you used to walk? But here's something that's very important as well. His brother is coming, and his brother is coming with several hundred men. And you know what they're coming for? I don't think they're coming to have a picnic. I don't think everybody's bringing the hot dogs and the buns and the onions and the chili and the mustard. But God changes his brother. In that when they begin to see each other, they, they were not fighting. They embraced and they began to weep upon one another. God changed the situation. I'm trying to tell you, if there's some things in the midst of your family that need to be changed, God is in the business through prayer of changing those things. And you know what? Sometimes He might not change who you want to change, but maybe He'll just wind up changing you. And you remember Simon Peter? She's going to pull up something else. Satan really wanted Simon Peter. Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as sweet. Can I tell you, everybody in here, Satan desires to have you. But you know what the Lord says? I have prayed for you. I have prayed that your faith, that it does not fail. And when you are converted, he says, strengthen thy brethren. Well, how many remembers the condition of the first century church in Acts 2? Here's what they continued to do. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And they begin to go around telling everybody about Jesus. And they come before the Sanhedrin and say, don't you preach anymore in the name of Jesus. But you know what? They found themselves and went somewhere. Bless God. They begin to pray. And they were all filled again with the Holy Ghost. And the place was shaken with the presence of that of God. Prayer changes things. How about this? James' exhortation in view of the coming of the Lord. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, and you can read it on. Prayer changes things. But here's the final thing. There is the power 
of Christ. Jesus has compassion on the young man's mother. He stops the procession and he commands the young man to arise and immediately he came back to life and began to speak and was restored to his mother. Deborah, I just have a flashback. Chris knows I have flashbacks a lot. I don't think these are from what something somebody may have taken years ago. I think these are different flashbacks. Hello out there. I remember when we went to Newfound Gap. Remember? And there was a guy out there that was preaching. And, you know, people were standing all around, and some was receptive positively, and some was negative. You remember? And I'm just listening. I can just see in my mind as the procession is going on, and the young man is in the casket, and his mother, a widow, is leading the way, and then Jesus and his disciples and a multitude of people come on the scene. I, I got a feeling some of the skeptics were saying, now what is he doing? What is he up to? And he puts his hand on the casket. He says, young man, I want you to arise. And he sits up. And he begins to talk. And Jesus takes him and carries him to his mother. Did you know the power of Christ is the greatest power on earth and in heaven? In the discourse of the Good Shepherd, it's in John 10. Here's what Jesus says. My Father loves me. You know why my Father loves me? Because I lay down my life. And you know what? I lay my life that I may take it up again. Joy, don't move. Hold, hold back up just for a minute. Did you, did you get that? Did you know that there were not devils or demons in hell that could take the life of Jesus? Jesus laid down his life. He laid it down that he might take it up again. Verse 18, please, ma'am. No man can take it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power. You know what? To lay it down. I've got power to take it up again. This is a commandment that I have received of my Father. Y'all, we should not wait to Easter to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We should talk about His death and resurrection throughout the year. Even the first Sunday and then of the month of August 2017 of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We shouldn't have to wait to Easter. Jesus Christ is alive and He's alive forevermore. You remember Peter's sermon in Acts 2, 23 and 24? Him being delivered by the determined, the determined counsel, they were determined, and for knowledge of God, you have taken up by wicked hands, you have crucified and slain. Verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. There was no way that death could hold Jesus, that the grave could hold Jesus. There was no way. It was impossible. And then there's John. John was cast on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God, for being a witness. And you know what he did? He saw Jesus like he never saw Jesus before. And when he saw Jesus, he fell down as dead. But I want you to notice what the Lord says. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, 
fear not. He says, I am the first and I'm the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Did you know that death is an enemy? George going to pull up Revelation again. We're going to go right back again. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And if you read in the next chapter of Revelation, you will find that one of the things it mentions about the new people, people that are in heaven, there is no more death. You know why there's no more death? Because death has been cast into the lake of fire. The power of Christ. Can I tell you in closing that, that Christ has got power to save you? He's got power to save you. He's got power to change you. He's got power to rearrange you. Can I tell you that he's got power to save you and sanctify you and baptize you in the Holy Ghost? Can I tell you that he's got power that one day that he can take you home? Life's five great powers. How many wants to go to heaven? Hey, I tell you what, let's do it this way. How many of you want to go to hell? Let's, let's, let's narrow it down a little bit. That's what I figured. She don't have this, but it's in Romans 10 and 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in thy heart that God has, what? Raised him from the dead. That shall be saved. You know what? We have made salvation and getting right with God such a denominational thing. That you got to do this and you got to do the other. We've got to go by the manual. You know, the Bible says if you'll just believe in your heart. Ain't it right, honey? Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died and was resurrected. He says, thou shall be saved saved. And then a few verses down he says, but, you know, about whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord. <laughs> Ain't she good? Sh shall be saved. How about this morning? I want you to stand. Now asking the music, uh, the musicians to come. We're going to get some piped in music today. We're going to give our musicians the time to pray.